Okay, now, when we ended last week, we just started looking at uh, chapter 3, verse 20 to 35, and my clicker's working, there it is, we just started looking at that, and as I said, Mark reports that Jesus enters an unidentified house in an unidentified location, and the crowd gathers there, that the crowd is so thick or so dense and or so needy that Jesus and his disciples, they're not even able to eat. And when his family hears this, presumably that's what's motivating him. When his family heard that he was foregoing the basic human need of eating, they assume that the, the pressure and the stress and the intensity of his ministry that it had all come together and he'd suffered some kind of mental breakdown. So they planned to go and seize him and to take him home so he could recuperate there. So they think he's lost his mind and they're going to come and, and bring him home so he can recuperate. Now Mark interrupts that story of the family's intervention. He begins it and then he interrupts it with the story of scribes who came from Jerusalem. Now, these scribes, they could not deny Jesus' mighty works. You see, that was a loser's move. You couldn't come in because everybody knew he had done mighty works. So you, you, you weren't going to get any traction coming in denying that. So they couldn't deny he'd done any mighty works. But given that he did not fit with their traditional notions of piety, I mean, hobnobbing with sinners, not fasting not observing the Sabbath in the way they thought he should. So given that he didn't fit with their traditional notions of piety, they conclude in verse 22 that a demon was empowering him. That's what they conclude and, and claim. Indeed, Jesus' power was so extraordinary that he's coming up and you have these people who are possessed by multiple demons and he's simply telling them to leave. His power is so extraordinary that they say he's possessed by Beelzebul, the chief of demons, Satan himself. And that's why the demons listen to him, because the chief demon is inhabiting Jesus. That's the secret of his remarkable exorcisms, is that he's inhabited or controlled by Beelzebul. Now, as a footnote... The majority of scholars think that the, the name Beelzebul, that it means Lord of the dwelling. And the dwelling there is, it's either the house of demons or the house of a pagan god. But either way, he's the chief demon. It's another way of referring to Satan. In verses 23 to 26, Jesus shows them the implausibility of that accusation. They're saying, no, the reason the demons are so responsive is he's being possessed by the chief demon. And Jesus shows them the implausibility of that accusation by pointing out that such serious infighting within Satan's household, well, that would spell its doom. If you've got that kind of internal warring going on, in Satan's own household. Well, that would be the end of that. And then in verse 27, he gives the correct explanation of his exorcisms. You see, they're trying to say, no, 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 see, it's just because he's controlled by this, by Beelzebul, by the chief of demons. That's what's going on now. Verse 27, he gives the correct explanation. He says, but no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. And his point is that his exorcisms are the opposite of working for Satan. They're an unprecedented expression of power over Satan. He's certainly not working with him. He's, he's exercising power over Satan. Satan is the strong man that Jesus has tied up so as to be able to take away his goods. That is to free those Satan had taken over. Now in Matthew chapter 12 verse 28 and in Luke chapter 11 verse 20, 
Jesus expressly ties his exercise of power over Satan, this extraordinary power that he has. He expressly ties his exercise of that power over Satan to his ushering in the kingdom. You see, these things, it is a manifestation of the kingdom's arrival. He says in those verses, Matthew 12, 28, and Luke eleven twenty. 20, but if by the Spirit of God, if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, and it is, he says, but if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. You see, that's, that's really the, the, the significance of his exorcisms. His expression of power over Satan is that the kingdom of God is invading the here and now. And it is manifested in the Lord's power over Satan. Because the, because the scribes, these experts in the law, had made a considered and final judgment that Jesus was a vessel of Satan. So much so that they, they point that out. They, they declared it publicly, calling him a vessel of Satan, and they did it in his presence. Okay, they're having made this considered and final judgment that he's a vessel of Satan. Because of that, Jesus says in chapter 3, verse 29, that whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness. He's guilty of an eternal sin. In other words, whoever declares with finality that the Spirit-led and Spirit-empowered Christ is satanic has committed a sin that will never be forgiven because acceptance of Christ as divine is a prerequisite for all forgiveness. So when you have come in and come to this conclusion, this final conclusion so that you will declare publicly in the Lord's presence that he's an agent of Satan, well, you will not be forgiven because you cannot in that understanding and conviction ever receive forgiveness because a prerequisite to receiving forgiveness is to recognize the opposite, that he is divine. He is the agent of God. He is the Messiah. In verses 31 to 35, he completes the report now of Jesus' family coming to take him away because they think he's out of his mind. So he begins that report. He then interrupts it, inserts this story about the scribes coming and accusing him of being possessed by Beelzebul. Now, the, the, the fact he does that, the fact that this intervention by the families interrupted by the insertion of that Beelzebul accusation. I mentioned last week that's a literary technique known as an intercalation of which Mark is fond, but it highlights the parallel or similarities in the episodes. And as Mark Strauss says in his commentary, he says the skepticism and false conclusions about Jesus made by his family are parallel to the rejection and false claims about him made by the religious leaders of Israel. They're not identical. They're not with the same finality. But you see, he says, in both cases, Jesus' own people reject him. His family is coming to get him. They're coming to get him saying he's out of his mind. Something's happened to him. We're sorry. We need to take him home and let him recuperate. Instead of recognizing who he is and what he's doing. And so you see the same thing when the scribes from Jerusalem come down. They're making these accusations against him that he's possessed by Beelzebul. Now Jesus' mothers and brothers, and that may refer to siblings, so if that's the case, then his sisters would be there. But his mothers and brothers, they pass word to him from the outside, presumably because they can't reach him. Because the crowd is so, so thick. And when Jesus is informed that they're outside asking Asking for him, he asked, who are my mother and my brothers? And then looking at the crowd, looking at the group that's seated around him, his disciples, he says, here, he says, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. 
You see, there is a spiritual family. There is a spiritual family that results not from biological descent, but from a shared commitment to the will of God, which commitment is now expressed preeminently in faith in Jesus Christ. And those who share that faith, they are His and each other's family. There is a spiritual family. And those who share that commitment to the will of God, preeminently expressed in the conviction about who Jesus is, family. Now that's significant and that has huge implications. Now Jesus is again, he's again beside the Sea of Galilee at the beginning of chapter 4, and he sits in a boat in the water with a huge crowd, just in the water, with a huge crowd right on the shore close to him. And Mark says in 4, 2, that Jesus was teaching many things in parables. And the first of which is the parable of the sower. And I'm going to talk about in a second, but I first want to say a little bit about parables in general. Now, the English word parable, it's taken from a Greek word parabole, as you can see, parable, parabole. It's taken from that word, but parabole, like the Hebrew and Aramaic counterpart, it has a much broader meaning. Parabole in the Gospels has a much broader meaning than what we typically associate with parable. It's a broader meaning that, in addition to what we would call parables, parabole in the Gospel, it covers sayings that we would classify as proverbs, maxims, riddles, and even comparisons and contrasts. The parables of Jesus, when you try to, what is a definition of, of the Lord's parables? I think they can best be defined as a word picture, okay, so you, a, a word picture of a familiar but fictional or imaginary circumstance that's given to communicate indirectly by analogy truth about the hearer's circumstance so as to motivate the hearer to act on his or her new insight. Now, I think that's a good definition of the Lord's parables. Now that's more detailed, but I think more adequate than the popular definition earthly stories with heavenly meanings. But this is what the Lord's parables are. And inherent in that definition is the notion that the purpose of parables is to communicate effectively. There seems to be confusion about this. The purpose of parables is to communicate effectively. That Jesus intended to communicate by parables, it's obvious from the fact he told them. You see, rather than remaining silent, and this intention that, it, that he intends to communicate by them, that intention is confirmed by his urging people to hear what he is saying through the parable. As he does in Matthew chapter 13, 9 and Matthew 21, 33. And his questions to the disciples in Mark chapter 4, verse, th verse 13. They make clear his intention that they understand the parables. He says, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? He wants them to understand the parables. They are told to communicate. So that's something that's significant. In Matthew 13, 34 and 35, it indicates that his speaking in parables has a revelatory function. He is trying to reveal truth. He's trying to communicate through his parables. But that raises the question, how does that communicative purpose, how does it square with a text like Mark 4, 10 through 12, or the parallels of that text that you see in Matthew 13 and in Luke 8, where it says here, and when he, and when he was alone, those around him with the 12 asked him about the parables, and he said to them, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom, but for those outside, everything is in parables, so that they, now he's, now he's referring to Isaiah, so that they may indeed see but not perceive and may indeed hear but not understand lest they should turn 
and be forgiven. So there's this question about, okay, if parables are in fact told with communicative intent, if he's telling them to reveal something to them, well, what do you make of this text? You see, this text and the parallels, they could be read. They could be read to teach that Jesus told parables to obscure the truth so as to prevent some people from coming to understanding and salvation. That he's trying to hide the truth from some people so they don't come to salvation. It could be taken that way, but I think that's a misunderstanding. I think that's a misinterpretation. What Mark chapter 4, verses 10 to 12 and the parallels, what they teach is that Jesus speaks the truth about the kingdom in disarming and defense piercing form in that form of parables so that the hardness that Isaiah talks about so that the Isaianic hardness of the outsiders in failing to perceive and understand the truth without which hardness they could turn and be healed and be saved so that that hardness it's told that that Isianic hardness will be manifested clearly. It'll be manifested clearly. See, by giving the unbelievers the maximum opportunity to engage and ultimately to receive the truth by presenting it indirectly in pictorial language, he put their hardness in the boldest relief possible. You see, by, by telling them in parables and giving them this indirect pictorial language that optimizes their ability to, your ability to pierce their defenses. You see, so you can, it is a situation where I'm telling you this so it has the maximum opportunity to get past your wall. And though when I do that, and you reject, I am thereby putting your hardness in boldest, boldest relief because you are rejecting even when I give you the truth in defense-piercing form. I think that's what he's telling. He's saying that by doing this, I am showing that or putting that in the, in, so you manifest your hardness, it's a testimony against you that you reject even when presented in this way. And the report of, of his stated purpose, how does that function in the gospel? It functions in the gospel as encouraging the readers to receive the message. You see, because to reject the message that's being presented in the gospels, to do that is to show oneself to be among the hard-hearted. And so that's why I think it's in Mark. Now that parables are intended to communicate effectively doesn't mean that parables are immediately or easily comprehended. They are not. That's not what that means. The disciples found some of Jesus' parables puzzling. And they had to go and ask him for explanations. The effectiveness of a parable it sometimes depends on the meaning not being apparent on the surface. You see, to, to, it, part of its effectiveness and how it operates depends on that kind of veil so it can get past your defenses. And so it's not always immediately obvious what's going on. You see, that's part of how it, it draws the person in. Is that it's, you know, that's why... It's effective. If you just come out and blast somebody and tell them straight up so they hear it right away, well, then they're... But if you tell them a little story and then it comes in in the back door and then they realize, oh, okay, well, you see, you got past it. So now they can hear it. And I think that's what's going on in the parables. They communicate effectively in their ability to bring a message home. Not in their ability to convey information directly or patently. That's not how they function. Let me read to you Klein Snodgrass in his just wonderful book on parables titled Stories with Intent, The Comprehensive Guide to the Parables of Jesus. He says, parables are not always obvious 
and self-explanatory. But even when enigmatic, their purpose is to enlighten. The very uncertainty of their reference is part of their appeal and often the means of their effectiveness, but they are not meant to obfuscate. And he says, he thinks an apt summary, he like paraphrases Mark 4.22, an apt summary of the purpose of the parables, nothing is hidden in parables except that it should be brought into the open. So that's how he looks at it. Robert Stein in his chapter in Longnecker's book, The Challenge of Parables, he says, Through a parable, Nathan was able to discuss the issue of David's murder of Uriah and his adultery with Uriah's wife, for the reality part of the parable was only recognized after the parable had been told and explained. As he says here, how far would Nathan have gotten if he had said to David, O king, I'd like to talk to you about your adultery with Bathsheba and your murder of Uriah. I, I got a clue for you. He wouldn't have gotten very far. <laughs> you just come out and say, I want to, I want to talk about it. He didn't do that. You see, he says, the nature of a parable, however, enabled the prophet to speak to David about both his adultery and his murder for disarmed... By the innocuous nature of the parable, David was open to judge honestly the issue at hand. You see, so it, it was the optimum way of piercing his defense so that he could get the message. Now, if he had rejected that, what would that be doing? That would be holding his hardness of heart in boldest relief because he had rejected it even when presented in that indirect pictorial language. So that's what I think is going on in, in this thing about... Uh, you know, because I just see it, I hear it sometimes, well, the idea that, well, he's trying to hide the truth. I don't think that's right. I think he's delivering the truth. Now, in 4.13, Jesus asked if they understand the parable of the sower. You're familiar with the parable of the sower. And then he gives this explanation to the disciples in verses 14 to 20. And the focus of the parable, the focus is on the receptivity and the conditions of the soils that receive the word so much so that some people refer to this parable as the parable of the soils. It serves as a warning. It serves as a warning to those who hear the good news of the kingdom of God that they not be like those portrayed in the first three soils. Simply being exposed to the word. Simply hearing, having these words strike your eardrum. That's not enough. You have to receive it as good soil, meaning one must respond to it in repentance and with perseverance. You have to react to it. You have to engage it. You can't just hear it in the sense of just outlaving it. You have to hear it in the sense of taking it in, really hearing it. You see, and that's what he's talking about in the parable. As Snodgrass says, he says, the parable is a description of various responses to hearing God's word and surely depicts the responses Jesus encountered in his own ministry. The parable warns against superficial hearing, but it also anticipates real and productive hearing. Real hearing is hearing that leads to obedience. And we should not forget that the Hebrew verb for hearing is often translated in English as obey. A C.F.D. Moole, in his commentary on Mark, he says of the, of the parable, words may be sound and lively enough, but it's up to each hearer to let them sink in and become fruitful. You know this in your life, right? You know how you can sit here and hear something, but you're not really hearing it? You know, you, you, you might as well turn away and inside you're going, blah, 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 blah. Right? You're hearing it, but you're not hearing it. And that's the idea. He says, but it's up to each hearer to let, let them sink in and become fruitful. If he only hears without responding, without doing something about it, and committing himself to their meaning then the words are in danger of being lost or of never coming to anything. The whole story thus becomes a parable about the learner's responsibility and about the importance of learning with one's whole will and obedience and not merely with one's head. 
So this is what Jesus is telling them in, in this parable. The parable of the sower, it's about how will you receive the message of the kingdom that I am announcing? Will you engage it? Will you absorb it? Or will you simply just hear the words? Then in 21, verse 4, 21 to 23, he gives the parable or analogy of a lamp on a stand. The lamp, a lamp's not brought. It's not brought in somewhere to have its purpose of providing illumination, to have that purpose negated by concealment. It's not brought in for that. Rather, it's brought in to have that purpose fulfilled by placing it on a stand. And the reason its purpose is fulfilled rather than negated is that things are hidden or concealed in order to be revealed or illuminated. See, hiding or concealing something is different than discarding it. It's different than throwing it away. One hides or conceals something. One who does that does so with the intent to retrieve it later. That's what hiding and concealing means versus discarding. I do it with the intent to retrieve it later and thus does so with the intent to make that thing manifest at some future point to reveal or to illuminate it at the future chosen time. Truths were hidden by God ultimately to be revealed by the light of his word, the message of the kingdom of God that Jesus is bringing, that Jesus is proclaiming, that he is placing on a stand. So there were these truths that by Christ proclaiming the kingdom of God are now being illuminated. You don't conceal it. You put it on a stand as he is doing. Now in Matthew chapter 5, 15... Jesus uses this same imagery of people putting a lamp, a lamp on a stand instead of under a basket. But there his purpose is different. Okay, there the imagery has a different purpose. There he's speaking of the need for Christians to live openly righteous lives that others may see our good works and give glory to God. That's not what he's doing here. That's not how, what he's talking about in Mark. Now in, in 4.23... And also in verse 9, he calls those who have ears to hear. He calls those who have ears to hear, those who are sufficiently open to the truth, to consider it fairly. You see, and that's crucial. Like I say, you can hear things, but not really be open to them that you consider them fairly. I have often said that in when John pursued me with the gospel, one of the things that happened was I said he got me to the point of objectivity, by which I mean I was willing to honestly consider, is there anything to this? You see, that means by his persistence, he got me to have ears to hear. And that's what he's talking about, where you're open enough to consider these things, you'll, you know, you'll, you'll consider them fairly. And then he tells them that to exercise that hearing capacity. Those who have ears to hear, he tells them to exercise that hearing capacity diligently. They need to hear the message in the sense of come to accept it. Hear it in that full sense. Internalize it as truth, not simply let it bounce off your eardrums. And then he gives the parable or analogy of the measure. In 424 and 25, he elaborates on the command that they hear him. Those who have ears, hear him. He elaborates on that, that they put effort into the process so that they receive the message. He commands them to hear. What do you mean hear? I'm hearing it. No, no, no. There's an active side of this. You have to engage it. And his command to do that, he elaborates on that command that they put effort into this process so that they receive the message. And he commands them to pay attention and he encourages, encourages them to do so with a proverb. With a proverb. See, with the measure you use, 
It'll be measured to you. Wrestle with this. Put effort into this. Don't just hear it and be lazy and not engage it. Why? Because with the measure you use, it'll be measured to you. And still more will be added. And the sense of that proverb is essentially, you get back what you put in. Put in something. It will pay dividends. Put in effort. Don't be lazy. Don't think, I don't care about this stuff. I already know this stuff. I already know. Bonk, bonk, bonk. Grab it. Wrestle with it. Engage it. Put effort into it. And it'll pay back. It'll pay back. As Mark Strauss says, he says, those who take the time and energy to hear and respond to Jesus' kingdom teaching will receive back their investment and even more. And the even more he fleshes out in verse 25, it refers to the reception of divine revelation. As Strauss says, he says, those who hear and respond to the message of the kingdom of God, those who have ears to hear, who are sufficiently open that they can consider it fairly, and put effort into that hearing, you see, hear and respond to the message of the kingdom, they will receive even greater revelation because when you do that, you don't stay in the same position. When I now receive this revelation, I now move to this perspective and I'm, I'm open and available for greater revelation. Now I'm enlightened to this position and I'm open for more. When I shut myself off, I get nothing. I get nothing. So he says, those who hear and respond to the message of the kingdom of God will receive even greater revelation, while those who reject what they've heard will be blinded even further. You see, as I keep turning away, turning away, turning away, I won't listen, won't listen, won't listen. Okay, well, I'm just being blinded willfully. He says, the the sayings thus parallel Jesus' explanation for why he teaches in parables in 4, 11, and 12. To those who are responsive to Jesus' kingdom teaching, the parables provide even greater spiritual insight. But for the hard-hearted outsiders who reject the message, they will look and look but not perceive, and hear and hear but not understand. Their spiritual blindness will only increase because they reject the message that is presented optimally for them. And they just say, no, 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 no. All right, well, there's something at work here. I don't want to hear it. That's what it is. You know, when the atheists sit here and they build all of these things and sit here and all this stuff, they simply don't want it to be true. And people have, people have asked some, look, if, if in fact Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, would you believe it? If that's a fact, no, I'm not, you know, not going to mess with that. You see, there are implications of these things, and we all know that intuitively. We know that if you come to the conviction of who Jesus is, okay, well, that's a whopper, baby. <laughs> or Seinfeld would say, that's a big matzo ball out there. You see, that, that has implications. So I'd rather not. That's why people are so resistant to talking. They don't want to engage it because they know down the road, if I start looking at this, uh uh-oh, I don't want that. All right, we'll see, what is that? That's just hardness of heart. And it'll it'll get dressed up into intellectual sophistication and all that. Why is that? That's the ego to be protected. But it's simply hardness of heart is what's going on. Now, Jesus tells them in in four, in in chapter four, you know, I've mentioned that, that, Jesus' teaching about the arrival in his ministry of the kingdom of God, well, this raised questions. I mean, this raised questions. People have been longing for this tremendous intervention of God, the kingdom of God, for God to heal the broken world. They've been longing for that. And people saw in Jesus and his ministry, they saw something new, something exciting and powerful But there was a disconnect between what they saw in Jesus' ministry, as great as it was, and the glorious state for which they longed. Jesus is doing great things, powerful things, exciting things. 
But there was a disconnect between what they were seeing and what they longed for. Now, given their understanding as first century Jews, that the arrival of the kingdom would mean the end of the old sin-marred age, they questioned how Jesus could speak of the kingdom's presence when they were surrounded by the hallmarks of the old age. Sin, fragmentation, suffering, sorrow, death, pain, disease, all of that. And Jesus is saying, the kingdom is at hand. The kingdom is among you. If I cast out demons, by the, then the kingdom of God is present. You see, and they say, well, I see all of this tremendous stuff, but how can that be when I still see the hallmarks of the old age and the old order? And one of the parables in which Jesus addresses that problem is the parable of the growing seed, which occurs only in Mark chapter 4, verses 26 to 29. It says, and he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. Now, the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is analogous to the entire scene narrated in the parable. In the parable, there's an initial sowing of seed that without any visible cause, that is by the hand of God. You see, there is this initial sowing that without any visible cause, ultimately, culminates in the blessing of a crop of grain ripe for harvest. So I have this sowing, and it culminates in what? This tremendous blessing of a crop of grain that is ripe for harvest. It culminates in an expression of the sown seed that looks quite different from its initial state. A newly sown field. A newly sown field looks very different from a harvest, a crop that's ripe for harvest. And it culminates in that, and it's something that looks very different. The kingdom of God is like that. It is like that in that the kingdom is inaugurated, begun, instituted through Christ's ministry, Death, resurrection, ascension, and outpouring of the Spirit through that complex of events. The kingdom is inaugurated, and that kingdom will, without any visible cause, ultimately culminate in the blessing of the consummated kingdom. An expression of the inaugurated kingdom that looks quite different from its initial state. So here, just as you have a newly sown field that what produces this, and this looks quite different from this, but they are all of one piece. That is how it is with the kingdom that Jesus inaugurates. It will culminate in the fullness of the kingdom of God, in the perfect divine utopia, in the reality in which there will be no more death, mourning, crying, pain, suffering, disease, any of that. The full-blown thing for which it is present in the beginning. It is present in the seed. Let me read to you what a couple commentators say about this. C.B. Cranfield. As seed time is followed in due time by harvest, so will the present hiddenness and ambiguousness of the kingdom of God be succeeded by its glorious manifestation. Klein Snodgrass says... Jesus' ministry has inaugurated a sequence of action leading to the fullness of God's kingdom just as surely as sowing sets in play a spontaneous process leading to harvest. Even if hidden, 
and unrecognized, the kingdom is present and will be fully revealed in God's time. The point is not merely that the kingdom is coming, for most Jews would assume that. The parable asserts that the kingdom process is already underway with Jesus' teaching and activity and that the glorious revelation of the kingdom has its beginning in and is directly tied to what he's doing. He is the kingdom bringer. It's all one piece. You see, the kingdom's coming. It's more complex than the expectation That political subjugation, evil and want, would disappear as soon as it arrived. It's more complicated than that. Snodgrass comments, he says, from the parable, people would have to expand their understanding of the kingdom to allow for its not being so obvious and for some passing of time before it was fully in effect. Just like seed harvest, inauguration consummation, You see, that's what's going on. Snodgrass adds, he says, often overlooked is the importance of this parable for understanding Jesus' eschatological teaching, his teaching about the end. This parable anticipates some length of time between Jesus' present and the end time appearing of the kingdom. The kingdom involves the passing of time. No hint is given as to how long that time might be. But this parable should at least slow down any overemphasis on a soon appearing kingdom. This and other parables assume at least two stages of the kingdom. A time of sowing and growth and a time of harvest. There is an inauguration when we are in the overlap of ages. Then at his return there is the consummation when all that is contrary to the eternal vision of God is stripped out. And all that exists for eternity is the perfect eternal vision of God see that's what Jesus is talking about now, as it's God who in ways unknown to man produces the precious harvest from something as subtle and unobtrusive as a seeded field so it's God who in ways unknown to man will produce the new heaven and the new earth from something as seemingly insignificant as the ministry of a Jewish carpenter in a backwater of the Roman Empire. Where's the kingdom of God being ushered in? Where's this great thing going to happen? Rome? This little nowhere out of the way place. Unobtrusive. People look at it, can't be. Well, you'll see. What about the mustard seed? We'll talk about that next week. Tiniest little thing huge thing you see that's that's the point that he's after snodgrass he says the parable then is optimistic in spite of appearances people may be confident that what has begun with jesus will lead to the full realization of the kingdom although they are not mentioned in the text patience and encouragement are results flowing from this parable i heard that bell but do you see this idea that it is god who is at work in this And so you look at things and you have people in the world say, I don't see, it's not obvious to me. I don't doubt it's not obvious to you. I don't doubt it's not obvious because we live in this overlap of ages, but a time is coming when it's going to be obvious to Ray Charles. Okay, It's going to be obvious. And it's obvious to those who are participants, who have surrendered to this work of God, and we see it. We see what God is doing in this world and what he's done and what he's launched in the life of Jesus Christ. Next week.